Part two, chapter five of Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert, translated by Eleanor Mark Saverling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Part two, chapter five. It was a Sunday in February, an afternoon when the snow was falling. They had all, Monsieur and Madame Bovary, Homais and Monsieur Léon, gone to see a yarn mill that was being built in the valley a mile and a half from Yonville. The druggist had taken Napoleon and Utterly to give them some exercise, and Justin accompanied them, carrying the umbrellas on his shoulder. Nothing, however, could be less curious than this curiosity. A great piece of waste ground on which, pell-mell, amid a mass of sand and stones, were a few brake wheels, already rusty, surrounded by a quadrangular building pierced by a number of little windows. The building was unfinished, the sky could be seen through the joists of the roofing. Attached to the stop plank of the gable, a bunch of straw mixed with corn ears fluttered its trickled ribbons in the wind. Homais was talking. He explained to the company the future importance of this establishment computed the strength of the floorings, the thickness of the walls, and regretted extremely not having a yardstick such as M. Binet possessed for his own special use. Emma, who had taken his arm, bent lightly against his shoulder, and she looked at the sun's disk shedding afar through the mist his pale splendour. She turned. Charles was there. His cap was drawn down over his eyebrows, and his two thick lips were trembling, which added a look of stupidity to his face. His very back, his calm back, was irritating to behold, and she saw written upon his coat all the platitude of the bearer. While she was considering him thus, tasting in her irritation a sort of depraved pleasure, Léon made a step forward. The cold that made him pale seemed to add a more gentle languor to his face. Between his cravat and his neck, the somewhat looser collar of his shirt showed the skin. The lobe of his ear looked out from beneath a lock of hair, and his large blue eyes, raised to the clouds, seemed to Emma more limpid and more beautiful than those mountain lakes where the heavens are mirrored. "'Wretched boy!' suddenly cried the chemist and he ran to his son, who had just precipitated himself into a heap of lime in order to whiten his boots. At the reproaches with which he was being overwhelmed, Napoleon began to roar, while Justin dried his shoes with a wisp of straw. But a knife was wanted. Charles offered his. Ah, oh, she said to herself, he carried a knife in his pocket, like a peasant. The hoar-frost was falling, and they turned back to Yonville. In the evening Madame Bovary did not go to her neighbours, and when Charles had left and she felt herself alone, the comparison re-began with the clearness of a sensation almost actual, and with that lengthening of perspective which memory gives to things. Looking from her bed at the clean fire that was burning, she still saw, as she had down there, Léon standing up with one hand behind his cane, and with the other holding Atelie, who was quietly sucking a piece of ice. She thought him charming. She could not tear herself away from him. She recalled his other attitudes on other days, the words he had spoken, the sound of his voice, his whole person, and she repeated, pouting out her lips as if for a kiss, Yes, charming, charming. Is he not in love? she asked herself. But with whom? With me? All the proofs arose before her at once. Her heart leapt. The flame of the fire threw a joyous light upon the ceiling. She turned on her back, stretching out her arms. Then began the eternal lamentations. Oh, if heaven had not willed it, and why not? What prevented it? When Charles came home at midnight, she seemed to have just awakened, and as he made a noise undressing, she complained of a headache, then asked carelessly what had happened that evening. Monsieur Léon, he said, went to his room early. She could not help smiling, and she fell asleep, her soul filled with a new delight. The next day, at dusk, she received a visit from Monsieur Leroux, the draper. 
He was a man of ability, was this shopkeeper. Born a Gascon, but bred a Norman, he grafted upon his southern volubility the cunning of a cauchois. His fat, flabby, beardless face seemed dyed by a decoction of liquorous, and his white hair made even more vivid the keen brilliance of his small black eyes. No one knew what he had been formerly. A peddler, said some, a banker at Routot, according to others. What was certain was that he made complex calculations in his head that would have frightened Binet himself. Polite to obsequiousness, he always held himself with his back bent in the position of one who bows or who invites. After leaving at the door his hat surrounded with crepe, he put down a green bandbox on the table and began by complaining to Madame, with many civilities, that he should have remained till that day without gaining her confidence. A poor shop like his was not made to attract a fashionable lady, he emphasised the words. Yet she had only to command, and he would undertake to provide her with anything she might wish, either in haberdashery or linen, millinery or fancy goods. For he went to town regularly four times a month. He was connected with the best houses. You could speak of him at the Trois Frères, or the Barbe d'Or, at the Grand Sauvage. All these gentlemen knew him, as well as the insides of their pockets. Today, then, he had come to show Madame, in passing, various articles he happened to have, thanks to a most rare opportunity. And he pulled out half a dozen embroidered collars from the box. Madame Bovary examined them. I do not require anything, she said. Then Monsieur Leroux delicately exhibited three Algerian scarves, several packets of English needles, a pair of straw slippers, and finally four egg cups in coconut wood carved in open work by convicts. Then, with both hands on the table, his neck stretched out, his figure bent forward, open mouthed, he watched Emma's look, who was walking up and down undecided amid these goods. From time to time, as if to remove some dust, he filliped with his nail the silk of the scarf spread out at full length, and they rustled with a little noise, making in the green twilight the gold spangles of their tissue scintillate like little stars. How much are they? A mere nothing, he replied, a mere nothing, but there's no hurry, whenever it's convenient. We're not Jews. She reflected for a few moments, and ended by again declining Monsieur Leroux's offer. He replied quite unconcernedly, Very well, we shall understand one another by and by. I have always got on with ladies, if I didn't with my own. Emma smiled. I wanted to tell you, he went on good-naturedly after his joke, that it isn't the money I should trouble about. Why, I could give you some if need be. She made a gesture of surprise. Ah, he said quickly and in a low voice, I shouldn't have to go far to find you some, rely on that. And he began asking after Père Tellier, the proprietor of the Café Francais, whom Monsieur Bovary was then attending. What's the matter with Père Tellier? He coughs so that he shakes the whole house, and I'm afraid he'll soon want a deal covering rather than a flannel vest. He was such a rake as a young man. These sort of people, madame, have not the least regularity. He's burnt up with brandy. Still, it's sad all the same to see an acquaintance go off. And while he fastened up his box, he discoursed about the doctor's patience. It's the weather, no doubt, he said, looking frowningly at the floor, that causes these illnesses. I, too, don't feel the thing. One of these days I shall even have to consult the doctor for a pain I have in my back. Well, good-bye, Madame Bovary. At your service, your very humble servant and he closed the door gently. Emma had her dinner served in her bedroom on a tray by the fireside. She was a long time over it. Everything was well with her. How good I was, she said to herself, thinking of the scarves. She heard some steps on the stairs. It was Léon. She got up and took from the chest of drawers the first pile of dusters to be hemmed. When he came in, she seemed very busy. The conversation languished. Madame Bovary gave it up every few minutes, whilst he himself seemed quite embarrassed. Seated on a low chair near the fire, he turned round in his fingers the ivory thimble case. 
She stitched on, or from time to time turned down the hem of the cloth with her nail. She did not speak. He was silent, captivated by her silence, as he would have been by her speech. Poor fellow, she thought. How have I displeased her? he asked himself. At last, however, Léon said that he should have one of these days to go to Rouen on some office business. Your music subscription is out. Am I to renew it? No, she replied. Why? Because, and pursing her lips, she slowly drew a long stitch of grey thread. This work irritated Léon. It seemed to roughen the ends of her fingers. A gallant phrase came into his head, but he did not risk it. Then you are giving it up, he went on. What? she asked hurriedly. Music? Ah, yes. Have I not my house to look after, my husband to attend to? A thousand things, in fact. Many duties that must be considered first. She looked at the clock. Charles was late. Then she affected anxiety. Two or three times she even repeated, He is so good. The clerk was fond of Monsieur Bovary, but this tenderness on his behalf astonished him unpleasantly. Nevertheless, he took up on his praises, which he said everyone was singing, especially the chemist. Ah, oh, he is a good fellow, continued Emma. Certainly, replied the clerk. And he began talking of Madame Homais, whose very untidy appearance generally made them laugh. What does it matter, interrupted Emma. A good housewife does not trouble about her appearance. Then she relapsed into silence. It was the same on the following days. Her talks, her manners, everything changed. She took interest in the housework, went to church regularly, and looked after her servant with more severity. She took Berta from nurse. When visitors called, Felicite brought her in, and Madame Bovary undressed her to show off her limbs. She declared she adored children. This was her consolation, her joy, her passion, and she accompanied her caresses with lyrical outbursts which would have reminded anyone but the Yonville people of Sachet in Notre-Dame de Paris. When Charles came home, he found his slippers put to warm near the fire. His waistcoat now never wanted lining, nor his shirt buttons, and it was quite a pleasure to see in the cupboard the nightcaps arranged in piles of the same height. She no longer grumbled, as formerly, at taking a turn in the garden. What he proposed was always done, although she did not understand the wishes to which she submitted without a murmur. And when Léon saw him by his fireside after dinner, his two hands on his stomach, his two feet on the fender, his two cheeks red with feeding, his eyes moist with happiness, the child crawling along the carpet, and this woman with the slender waist who came behind his armchair to kiss his forehead, what madness he said to himself and how to reach her and thus she seemed so virtuous and inaccessible to him that he lost all hope even the faintest but by this renunciation he placed her on an extraordinary pinnacle to him she stood outside those fleshly attributes from which he had nothing to obtain and in his heart she rose ever and became farther removed from him after the magnificent manner of an apotheosis that is taking wing it was one of those pure feelings that do not interfere with life that are cultivated because they are rare and whose loss would afflict more than their passion rejoices emma grew thinner her cheeks paler her face longer with her black hair, her large eyes, her aquiline nose, her bird-like walk, and always silent now, did she not seem to be passing through life, scarcely touching it, and to bear on her brow the vague impress of some divine destiny? She was so sad and so calm, at once so gentle and so reserved, that near her one felt oneself seized by an icy charm as we shudder in churches at the perfume of the flowers mingled with the cold of the marble. The others even did not escape from this seduction. The chemist said, She is a woman of great parts who wouldn't be misplaced in a sub-prefecture. The housewives admired her economy, the patients her politeness, the poor her charity. But... She was eaten up with desires, with rage, with hate. 
that dress with the narrow folds hid a distracted fear, of whose torment those chaste lips said nothing. She was in love with Léon, and sought solitude that she might with the more ease delight in his image. The sight of his form troubled the voluptuousness of this mediation. Emma thrilled at the sound of his step. Then, in his presence, the emotion subsided, and afterwards there remained to her only an immense astonishment that ended in sorrow. Léon did not know that when he left her in despair, she rose after he had gone to see him in the street. She concerned herself about his comings and goings. She watched his face. She invented quite a history to find an excuse for going to his room. The chemist's wife seemed happy to her to sleep under the same roof, and her thoughts constantly centred upon this house, like the lion door pigeons who came there to dip their red feet and white wings in its gutters. But the more Emma recognised her love, the more she crushed it down, that it might not be evident, that she might make it less. She would have liked Leon to guess it, and she imagined chances, catastrophes that should facilitate this. What restrained her was, no doubt, idleness and fear, and a sense of shame also. She thought she had repulsed him too much, that the time was past, that all was lost. Then pride and joy of being able to say to herself, I am virtuous, and to look at herself in the glass, taking resigned poses, consoled her a little for the sacrifice she believed she was making. Then the lusts of the flesh, the longing for money and the melancholy of passion all blended themselves into one suffering, and instead of turning her thoughts from it, she clave to it the more, urging herself to pain and seeking everywhere occasion for it. She was irritated by an ill-served dish or by a half-open door, bewailed the velvet she had not, the happiness she had missed, her two exalted dreams, her narrow home. What exasperated her was that Charles did not seem to notice her anguish. His conviction that he was making her happy seemed to her an imbecile insult, and his sureness on this point ingratitude. For whose sake, then, was she virtuous? Was it not for him the obstacle to all felicity, the cause of all misery, and, as it were, the sharp clasp of that complex strap that bucked her in on all sides? On him alone, then, she concentrated all the various hatreds that resulted from her boredom, and every effort to diminish only augmented it. For this useless trouble was added to the other reasons for despair, and contributed still more to the separation between them. Her own gentleness to herself made her rebel against him. Domestic mediocrity drove her to lewd fancies, marriage tenderness to adulterous desires. She would have liked Charles to beat her, that she might have a better right to hate him, to revenge herself upon him. She was surprised sometimes at the atrocious conjectures that came into her thoughts, and she had to go on smiling to hear repeated to her at all hours that she was happy, to pretend to be happy, to let it be believed. Yet she had loathing of this hypocrisy. She was seized with the temptation to flee somewhere with Léon, to try a new life, but at once a vague chasm full of darkness opened within her soul. Besides, he no longer loves me, she thought. What is to become of me? What help is to be hoped for? What consolation? What solace? She was left broken, breathless, inert, sobbing in a low voice with flowing tears. Why don't you tell Master? the servant asked her when she came in during these crises. It is the nerve, said Emma. Do not speak to him of it. It would worry him. Ah, yes, Felicite went on. You are just like Lagarine, Père Guerin's daughter, the fisherman at Polle that I used to know at Dieppe before I came to you. She was so sad, so sad, to see her standing upright on the threshold of her house. She seemed to you like a winding sheet spread out before the door. Her illness, it appears, was a kind of fog that she had in her head, and the doctors could not do anything, nor the priest either. When she was taken too bad, she went off quite alone to the seashore, so that the customs officer, going his rounds, often found her lying flat on her face, crying on the shingle. Then, after her marriage, it went off, they say. But with me, replied Emma, it was after marriage that it began.
End of part two, chapter five.